when you really look at something that is causing a, a sense of discomfort or displeasure, what we really like is for it to be different. Only it isn't different. Things are the way they are. Sometimes we can see a way with compassion and wisdom to change what is unfair, what is unjust, what shouldn't be. But more often than not, it becomes a matter of relinquishing that desire for things to be different and accept. So the third noble truth then is to see the ways in which we cause ourselves dukkha, stress, discomfort, suffering. And there's a certain logic that says, if I can see how I cause myself dukkha, I should therefore see the way to end it, simply to stop the cause. However, being human beings, at least this time around, we are subject to habit energy, to conditioning, to our long behavior patterns established over years and years and we often find that it is not easy to just stop causing ourselves suffering and stress. So the fourth noble truth lays out a path. It is in fact called the Noble Eightfold Path. Unlike the first three noble truths, which one studies and learns and penetrates and comes to a place of being able to say, I have realized these truths. The path is a path of practice. It is a path of what we do that will alleviate suffering, that will make life work better for ourselves and for those around us and by extension for all beings. The path has eight steps, logically, since it's called the Eightfold Path. Those steps are right view and right thinking. And here again, we're using the word right, not in contrast with wrong, but right as opposed to what would cause suffering. Is there a way to view a phenomena in a way that could alleviate suffering, that we would call right view, which leads us to right thinking, and then right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. This is not a path that goes from beginning to end. It's more circular. You can jump in and start any place. If you find yourself speaking in a way where you are regretting your words, you say, oh, I can practice right speech. I don't have to go back and start with right view. I can change right there and look at how I am speaking. These eight facets are put into three categories. The first being what is called the wisdom category. In Sanskrit, it's prajna in Pali, it's Panna, and that is right view and right thinking. Right view is to see things as they really are, not as they appear to be. And Buddhists define wisdom as seeing things as they really are. When we don't see things as they really are, we call that delusion, which is kind of the nice way of saying ignorance. But it doesn't mean as in stupidity, it means we are ignorant of seeing something, of seeing something the way it really is. But to see things as they really are leads to right thinking, thinking that will again help to alleviate and to end suffering. The second category is what is called uh, the category of sila in, in Pali, S-I-L-A, which means either morality or ethical behavior. And those three steps in that category are right speech, right action, and right livelihood, which we'll look at briefly this evening. 
And then that leads to the category that we call either discipline or concentration, and this is the training of the mind, while speech, action, and livelihood are training mind-body, effort, mindfulness, concentration is the training of the mind. And all of these facets support each other. I've used the illustration previously of the strands of a cable that are woven together. When each of those strands is strong, that cable is essentially unbreakable. So, knowing that all of us in this room see things as they really are all the time, making us incredibly wise beings, and therefore our thinking is clear and wholesome and skillful, we'll now look at that middle section, the section of morality, beginning with right speech. I always found it interesting from my earliest days of study that speech, our words, actually got its own place on this path. The Buddhists saw the words that we speak as being so powerful, having the powerful literally to kill the spirit of another being, to destroy, to cause wars. And if you think that's an exaggeration, just think back for a moment to something that was said to you years and years ago, maybe even 30 years ago or more, that still has kind of a sting to it. Is there anyone who cannot remember something like that? And regrettably, but truthfully, we have probably put out such words ourselves that remain in a sensitive place for someone else. The power of our words is extraordinary. I believe that there is nothing that we could do that would improve our relationships immediately as quickly as paying just a bit more attention to the words that we speak. Right speech involves right time and right place. And its core is truthfulness. It's stated in the texts to abstain from lying and to practice truthfulness, to abstain from harsh words, harsh speech, from idle chatter, from slanderous speech. That also includes gossip. Some of you already know this, but the actual definition of gossip is to speak about someone who is not present. Doesn't say to speak positively or negatively, just to speak about someone who is not present. And yes, of course, there can be exceptions where it is absolutely essential to speak about someone who's not present, but then speak as if that person were present. And we will improve our chances of practicing right speech. Right action, the second part of this triumvirate. Right action for us, for lay people, focuses on five basic precepts that were taught by the Buddha for the non-monastics, for us in other words. The first is stated as to not kill, but its broad meaning is really to do no harm in the world. There are many times when we cannot help, but certainly do no harm. The second is to not take that which is not freely given, or in other words, don't steal. The third is to not engage in sexual misconduct. At the time of the Buddha, sexual misconduct was as simple as remain true to your vows. If you are married, do not stray outside of your marriage. If you are in a committed relationship, do not stay, stray outside of that marriage. 
today, and we can't miss this over the last two weeks, we see that we have an obligation to protect people who are vulnerable, to protect children from sexual misconduct. The third of these, the fourth of these precepts, rather, is the precept of right speech, but it gets its own separate place on the path. And the fifth precept, and you can read this one of two ways, either to not use intoxicants or to not abuse intoxicants. And I assure you that the most devout, practicing, experienced Buddhists are divided in this. There are those, for instance, my first teacher, the Vietnamese monk, Thich Nhat Hanh, absolutely adamant, do not drink, do not take alcohol. And yet I've also known New Year's Eve parties with monks and nuns that became quite rambunctious. <laughs> quite a bit of imbibing. Is that the right word? There's one imbibe? Yes. It's sort of a nice way of saying that, you know. But the point is that intoxicants from the first sip affect the mind. The texts say they cloud the mind. And that is in opposition to what we're really trying to work toward, which is greater clarity to see things as they really are. So one, as always with these teachings, must take responsibility for oneself. As some of you know, all of these teachings are offered from a perspective of the Buddha saying, this is what I have learned. This is what has worked for me. This is what I offer. Try what you like. If it works for you, continue that practice. If it doesn't, abandon it. It's something that I happen to love about this path, is that the responsibility is mine. I don't get to blame someone else or something else for what's not working well in my life. But I do have the opportunity to change that. And I like that. So there you are. The three kind of middle steps of this path right speech, right action, and then the third being right livelihood. Although the Buddha and his monks had a very simple way of what we could call livelihood, although they had no income and no possessions, they taught that in turn they received food, medicine, cloth to make their robes, etc. But he knew that we had to earn our livelihood, most of us anyway. We had responsibilities for ourselves and for those who depend on us. So right livelihood means that our work needs to be honest, respectful. The classical terminology says skillful and honorable and wholesome. We don't bend the truth in order to sell a product. There should be no deception. And we can't make an assumption that certain professions automatically are honorable. It is the practitioners that make a certain profession honorable. Honorable doctors, honorable attorneys, honorable street cleaners, honorable teachers, honorable football coaches. There is nothing inherently honorable in the way one earns one's livelihood. It is how we practice. And that is absolutely aligned with the entire rest of the path. It is how we practice. So this is what we call morality teachings what we bring from within ourselves out into the world and into our relationships with ourselves and with others.